Hello, I'm Karenna Gore. I'm the executive director of the Center for Earth Ethics at Union Theological Seminary. I want to welcome all who are listening and watching to this fireside chat with Mona Pawaka. It comes in the context not only of the UN Water Conference and World Water Day, but also the culmination of a two-year senior fellowship that Mona has had with the center. I just wanna say a word about how deeply honored we are to have had her with us in this way. Mona is an elder of Havasupai, Hopi, and Tewa lineages. She is a social worker. She is a teacher. She is an internationally recognized voice for indigenous knowledge, for protecting water. She has been a founding force behind many organizations, including the Turtle Island Project and the International Council of the 13 Indigenous Grandmothers. And she is really just a beautiful, wonderful human being. And so with that, I welcome you to a fireside chat with Mona Palaka. Good morning, Mona. Good morning. It is so wonderful to be with you today. And I wanted to start by asking you a question about the UN and the Water Conference and World Water Day. How do you see the significance of these gatherings? I see these gatherings like this um, UN Water Conference as a sort of a um, culmination of many, 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 many years of um, a thoughtful, prayerful um, effort of um, the people who are the most impacted by decisions that are made at the at the level of the United Nations about our most significant and sacred element, the water. I know that I am speaking as an indigenous person. I may have a supai, the people of the blue green water from down at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. I am, um, as a result of that, I'm a member of the water clan of the Havasupai through my mother, who is of the Havasupai people down at the bottom of the canyon. And she always said that we live in a delicate balance and that this, um, our existence in this narrow place requires us to um, be very conscious of our relationship with that water that's there. And if you ever see the water that is within the Grand Canyon at this special place in Havasupai land, it's a beautiful blue, green color. To get there, you have to hike. You have to hike down the canyon. Um, the mail is still delivered by mule train on the backs of mules. Um, and so it reminds us of how delicate life is on earth and in relation to the water, the water that flows within the canyon. So um, having time for indigenous um, voice to be part of this United Nations water conference is um, very significant. It's historical. It's the first water, uh, a conference on water that the United Nations has had since 
77. And if you think about it as well, uh, they are calling it a conference. It is not a forum. It's not part of the, it's not an assembly of the UN, it's a conference. So even framing it that way um, is significant. I believe part of that is because then it allows participation of, of um, the voices of many. It allows for indigenous participation to have voice in this in this um, conference. And so um, it's very significant and um, historical, and I am so you know happy and grateful that I have an opportunity to participate. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I, you've talked about being from Parker, Arizona, as well as uh, growing up by the Colorado River. And I, I know as a member of Colorado River Indian tribes and, and then at one time an officer there, I wonder if you could say a little bit more about the water in the place that you grew up and any childhood memories that you have, especially of elders giving you teachings, if you feel comfortable sharing that. I, um, yes, I was born and raised in Parker, Arizona. I also want to mention that on my father's side, I'm Hopi and Tewa, uh, who are living in the mesas up in Northern Arizona. And um, the Hopi and Tewa, their villages are so you know way out in a really isolated area. They don't have rivers, lakes, and streams there, and they so you know so the relationship with the water again is very significant and um, important because what they rely on for their water is their prayers. They have they have a whole cycle of a prayer that is made that are made to sustain life. And part of that is their prayers for the rain. The rain to come to water their gardens, their fields. They faithfully plant their corn, their squash, their beans, their tobacco. They faithfully plant them and make their prayers and continue to make the prayers in the life cycle of this plant life. Part of that is faith, having faith in those prayers that they made, having belief that there's a power that is going to receive those prayers and in present them with rain to water their plants. So, you know, those are part of <clears throat> part of the the ways that um, you know these two people that I come from exist in these very delicate places. However, my parents in the early 40s were relocated, moved to Parker, Arizona, where the Colorado River Indian tribes was established. And the Colorado River Indian tribes is four different tribes. Mm. The uh, original people there are the Mojave people. And they were small, sm a, a small tribe. So the federal government decided that in order to establish it as a um, reservation, they would bring tribes of uh, the Colorado River tributaries there. 
And so they relocated Hopi families. And my family was one of those families. They relocated Navajo families and another little um, band of Paiute called the Chimoebi. And they were relocated to the Colorado River. We became the Colorado River Indian tribes. <clears throat> And the river, the uh, tribal lands straddle the river. We're on, we have uh, Arizona side and we have a California side of the river. And um, so I was born and raised there and all of our, my parents, um, we have a farm there, farmland. And um, so the, the river, irrigates all of the farmlands in the valley of the Colorado River Indian tribes. And so um, when I was growing up, we would um, go out to the river, big groups of families would go out to the river in the summertime and we would spend the whole day out there swimming and playing and the, parent, the um, parents all visiting each other and cooking together, sharing food. That's the way I grew up on the river. Mm. Um, and then um, when I became a young adult, I uh, worked in a program called Adventure-Based Recreation. And part of that was to working with the youth of the Colorado River India tribes as um, uh, to to. I called it uh, creating opportunities for a healthy lifestyle. And so in that program, uh, we had these um, canoe runs uh, where we would we would have um, all the we'd have a group of young people, youth, and a, um, older um, older youth and some adults who would, chaperone the children and we would take them at a certain point along at the river up in the north end of the reservation and we put in our canoes there and we would canoe the distance of our reservation and we would go to get to a certain point and we would take our canoes out and we would camp next morning Put the canoes in and go the rest of the way to the end of the reservation on the river. And so, um, you know, that I believe uh, part of that intention was to create um, uh, this experience for the youth, the experience of, you know, what, how valuable and important the river is to them so that they have a relationship with it by being in it and knowing its energy its its power and as well as the water life as well as well as the plant life that's along there um it and so that that was the way i uh i lived there on the river um, so that's been my experience. I've, I've, uh, also, um, with another tribe river tribe called the Wallapai nation, they have a river running operation. And so every year for about, um, seven years, I would go with the river runners when they're doing their, um, their first canoe run, I mean, not canoe, but river rafting run on the river. And uh, I would, I went, I would go with them as a spiritual advisor. Mm. And we would do blessing ceremonies um, on the first run on the river. And so every time I went, I would take either one of my, I took my, um, my daughters and then, um, Later on, I took my grandson and um, we would get put out on the river 
as we um, went along, we would gather a uh, willow because what we would do is we would build a sweat lodge there on the at one of the points where we would stop and uh, they would build a sweat lodge and I would run a sweat lodge for the river runners. And um, we would camp there and then the next day go the rest of the way. And so I, being in the canyon on the rafts, you see parts of the canyon, you see the river in, in so many different um, uh, ways that you don't see by just looking down at it. You're right in it. You're hitting those rafts and feeling that power and that water, you know, feeling all the elements because you're out there in the sun and this is like summertime, you know. <laughs> so, um, so my relationship with the river, you know, j goes beyond just um, it being um, something to look at. Mm -hmm but to experience it and to see the power of that water and how it's carved the Grand Canyon. Mm. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. I wanted to ask you a little bit about ceremonial and ritual uh, practices with water in the traditions that, that you come from, if, if it feels good to share. And you've already mentioned um, sweat lodge. Um, I wonder if you, if there's something about the use of water in sweat lodge or in any other ceremony or ritual that you would like to share. I'll go ahead and mention the sweat lodge. Um, in the sweat lodge, it is sort of like a sauna, but it's a ritual. It's a ceremony, and. Um, and we use hot rocks, hot lava rocks that are heated in a fire outside. And the sweat lodge is a dome-like structure. And the sweat lodge represents our mother, um, the mother's womb. So you crawl in there. It's, it's built in such a way that you're not going to walk in and, um, you know, have that kind of comfort. You crawl in in a humble way. So you crawl in and you come and you sit in there and the and it's um so most of the time when you're in there you're sitting in a fetal position and there's other people in there uh there's water that's brought in and the water representing the first first foundation of life and us taking time out to acknowledge it and pay our respect to it. Mm. Because we say it's like our mother water mm -hmm. because of the water we live in, in our mother's womb. Mm -hmm. And so in this way, we take the time to acknowledge it and be uh, respectful with it and pray with it. And so, um, so we use that and sprinkle the water on the hot stones, which becomes steam. The water changes, it becomes steam in the air. And so the steam comes up, we're breathing it, it covers our body. It go uh, through the heat, it's absorbing in our body. And then what happens is then the water, it removes the impurities or energies that are not useful to us. And so we sit where it's like this um, cleansing that occurs. So it's like a cycle where the, the water comes within us and it goes in and then it comes back out of us through our sweat. Mm. So it's this cleansing that occurs, um, not only physically, but spiritually emotionally um 
where where an en the energy within us changes and so uh through the water mm -hmm. and so that's how we use the water in the sweat lodge um <clears throat> then um i am a member of the uh, native american church I'm a officer of uh, Native American Church here in Southern Arizona. It's called uh, the Native American Church of Southern Arizona. I'm the treasurer of our church. And, and I'm also um, what is called a water woman. So in the ceremony in the morning time, um, a woman brings the water in and prays with it. And after she uh, prays with it, she sprinkles water on the earth, which is acknowledging, you know, that our mother, the earth also needs water, but also all of our ancestors, the spirits of our ancestors, the spirits of, of all of life on the earth we make that offering in that respectful manner with that water that I pray with. After I finish that, uh, it's blessed with some cedar smoke and, and it's given, passed around to everyone in the circle for them to drink. And we say, when we partake of that blessed water, it, it is, um, you know, rejuvenating, refreshing. You feel awake. You feel alive. I mean, you know, it's sort of like if you were to look, watch a plant that was kind of wilty and then you pour, you give it water and then, you know, you see it actually stand up, you know, and spread its little leaves and you know mm -hmm. that's I observed that you know yeah. in the ceremony of the people when we have these moments where we make a prayer with the water and all partake of the water and so um so those are some of the ways um myself and and the way my mother taught me was she said whenever you come upon water you acknowledge it and you know you acknowledge it you put your fingers into it and feel it on the tips of your fingers it when you put your fingertips in it you're introducing yourself to it it's mm -hmm. going to recognize you mm -hmm. so you do that so i do that and you know touch my heart and touch my head my mind so I'm receiving that blessing. So I, um, it's a it's a practice every day. Um, when I take a drink, my first drink of water, mm -hmm. I give a good thought to it and thankful. You know, give thanks to it to for it to um, make a way for me throughout the day. So that's how I use the water. Oh, thank you very much. Um... I know we all feel honored that you and blessed that you shared that with us. And we're also many of us aware that those traditional ways and ceremonies have not received respect sometimes from our governments and from our other uh, others in society. And, and we certainly want to stand with you and make sure that they do receive respect in that way and appreciate you sharing. I, uh, wonder if you could say a little bit more about when you acknowledge the water uh do you speak to the water and does the water speak to you you know i don't really necessarily have to say you know um speaking it's even a meditation a thought mm -hmm. in that thought you have you know, I was I was told that you use what you do is you you know go by you know you put your 
your um, sort of like your senses of, you know, how you feel and how you think, put that together and, you know, you express it. I meditate with it. I don't necessarily, it's when I'm in the ceremony, bringing in the morning water, I, you know, I verbally pray. Mm. Um, in the anywhere else, you know, I go ahead and touch the water and I'm, it's a whole meditation kind of thing. As far as the water talking back to me, you know, um, I was told that um, the water, in the water are our ancestors. And if you, you know, you hear water flowing, how it sounds, that nice, tingly kind of a sound hitting the rocks and I was told that um, when you hear those hear it that's your ancestors mm. blessing you letting you know they're they're here they're with you and they're blessing you this good and a good feeling comes over you I mean I don't know of anybody who doesn't like to hear the sound of water Yes. yes. So um, I know I get a really good feeling when if I'm by a stream um, down in the canyon, I would camp um, by the Havasu Creek. And, you know, laying in my tent and hearing that water, that creek flowing all night. You know, and then getting up in the morning and going to it. I mean, the, to me, you know, I, it's it's um, it's a wonderful experience to hear the water, even the ocean. You know, Beautiful. that's how it talks to us. Yes. Can you give? Uh an example of sacred waters what what we what it means when we hear that water is sacred or that a particular body of water is sacred yes um as an elder said to me was all water is sacred uh however in the society that we live in we have um you know, the world's religions have um, have wa water rituals. They have the baptismals. They have the christening. They have these various kinds of um, ceremonies using water in a blessing ceremony. And so I say, I say, you know, why is it so difficult for you know the the world to understand or to um accept that indigenous people use this 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 phrase water mm -hmm. water is sacred water is life because part of that we say you know like the water the waters of the world are one uh, and there throughout the world, uh, it's been widely accepted that there are these various bodies of water that are considered holy, like the um, Holy River Nile, the Holy River Ganji, the Holy River Jordan these bodies of water that are being that are accepted and called holy and are as far as i can tell being uh righteously preserved and protected yet bodies of water that we have here 
on Turtle Island or various um, lands and territories of indigenous people, uh, we, we are saying these waters that we rely on for our life are, we call those sacred. We acknowledge them as sacred. And um, I have certain responsibilities that we were given to um, preserve and protect them, to honor them, to respect them, uh, to always be um, aware of um, how they are, as if they were your mother, as if they were your grandmother, that you love and cherish and want to see live a good long life. That's what we want from our of our waters, because that water is going to give us that mm. a good long life. And so, um, so this is you know this is so um, important um, to, as one of my elders say, to make a paradigm shift. To make that paradigm shift of of um, from exclusion to inclusion, mm -hmm. that the waters are for all, and not even just humans, but all of life on the earth rely on water. Mm -hmm. And we must take care of the water for them as well. Because we rely on the plants and the animals, you know, for our own livelihood. So it's all connected. We are, you know, it's all one, you know. I right. say, so what's the problem? <laughs> <laughs> So what, you know? I I was thinking about also asking you about um the flowing bodies of water, the rivers, uh, that are not only on the surface, but also underground. And also now we hear a lot in the news about atmospheric rivers. And uh a lot of times you hear people talk on the news as if they've just discovered this. Uh, but I've heard you say that elders spoke about rivers in the sky uh, for a long time. So I wonder if you could say something about that, but also um, how do you see uh, all of these different flowing bodies of water around the earth? What does that tell us about, about the earth? They're all part of her life system. You know, they're all part of her life uh, her life system just like we she's a body a living body and um i'm like if you look at um the earth uh and all of the various watersheds that exist and if you look at them they are it, it it's like her veins her her life blood that flows it flows through her and yet we are you know blocking her system mm. by you know by the building the dams and the and even um you know, even some of the diversion of the waters so that the waters um, don't have their natural flow. But what my mother told me was that um, she said, um, she said that, um, you know, they may go ahead and divert it. They may go ahead and dam it, but 
they cannot hold that water back. And that water is going to, you know, it's going to find its way hmm. to get back to that channel that, or as they say, the bed, the bed, the river bed. It's going to find its way back there. It will, you know, it will, I mean, look at what happened with the Grand Canyon. It carved, the Colorado River carved that canyon. I, I mean, you know, that's what some people say. Mm -hmm. But, but um, you know, the, the water, um, the water cannot be held back. I mean, just, I mean, if you looked at even the mighty call, um, Mississippi, we, you know, the 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 these what's been happening, you know, with the flooding, the whole system of the Mississippi is sort of control in a controlled system, but even that system, which is man-made, fails. The river comes through, it's not going to stop. You know. Well, I, I wanted to ask you about the climate crisis, about climate change, and in particular, um, about a lot of people who, who talk about it say they bring to mind that there's ice melting at the poles and in Greenland. Um, and there's also the sea level rise that's happening around the world. And of course, those two things are related. And I wonder um, if there's a way that you think about and understand that um, that's in keeping with indigenous ways of thinking. Oh, yes. Um, you know, um, ever since I was maybe a teenage, became a teenager, um, and I was first exposed to some of the, um, some of the teachings of prophecies, they told, they told us that, and as a matter of fact, they, there was a delegation of indigenous people that went to the United Nations to deliver the messages to deliver the message that you must pay attention to what you're doing to Mother Earth. Mm. That there are some of these things you're doing are creating an imbalance and that there are these um, devastating results that will come if we do not pay attention to how we treat our mother, the earth. They delivered that message. And um, so I was, I was being told these things. I believed them. I never doubted them. Uh, and what this one elder told me was that, um, he said, look around. It's already happening. Uh, the chemicals that are being, you know, that are being, uh, that are contaminating our waters, the rivers, lakes, streams, um, even not our aquifers have an effect on uh, our, our being, our health, our development. But it's not only us, it's the animals too. Mm -hmm. And this was like way back in maybe early 70s, 69, something like that, where um, at that time, I recall hearing about how there were um, animals that were being born with, you know, instead of, you know, two eyes were being born with maybe three or four eyes, or they were out of, you know, they were being, they were being born deformed. Uh -huh. and. Um, and he said, it's already happening. These things are happening to our, you know, to life on earth and we must change it. We must stop it. Mm. And so many indigenous people made that their mission in life. 
to carry that message to the world. Mm -hmm. And so this is, you know, so, so for indigenous people, the things that are happening have been foretold to us that times like this were coming, but that we still have a chance to um, make that shift. And so even, you know, so we continue to, you know, knock on the doors, we continue to grow, go that extra mile to deliver a message. And that part of that message is that we are all related. Not just human beings, but all of life on earth. We are all related. We all are of our mother, the earth. If mother earth is being abused and she's not healthy, then we are not healthy. I mean, if, I mean you just think, look at, I mean, even psychologists or psychiatrists talk about this in behavioral health, you know, the cycles of trauma. Mm. And so, um, so it's, it's, um, this message has been out there for many years. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And what, what do you think about the UN as a way to make change? right now and what would you think what would you want people listening to this conversation to take away about a message they could bring to this UN water conference so the indigenous people who are um, throughout the world have been working on what we're calling the water declaration the indigenous people's water declaration <clears throat> and um it will be launched there at the water conference. It has taken many, many years and lives of indigenous people who have carried this torch, so to speak, you know. And um, throughout the years, you know, they they made this effort for over 20 years to bring forward the you know the UN declaration on the rights of indigenous people um and finally were successful at getting it adopted by the united nations so once it was adopted at the united nations then um it's given um it's given indigenous people a uh, more of a voice um and i think it's important for us to continue to keep uh, our foot in that door um oftentimes uh we're the last um to be even uh, considered in any of the environmental impacts that um are that result from uh some you know many many um you know, of the extractive industry. And so um, our voice through these declarations, um, they sort of, in a way, you know, it, to me anyway, is the indigenous people um, make their statement. This is how we honor and respect. This is our ethics with the United, with Mother Earth. Mm -hmm in exchange for our life, our right to live on Mother Earth and to have our generations continue to thrive in life. This is what we stand for. This is our ethics with water. We draw that line on the other side this is what we will not allow to happen to our waters mm -hmm. of our lands, of our territories. Not only surface water, but subterranean waters, mm -hmm. the underground rivers, lakes, and streams, the aquifers. Mm -hmm. 
we will not allow that to happen. We have a sacred responsibility. Some people talk about rights, and that's how we have to frame it under the United Nations as a right. But it, we, to us, it's our responsibility. It's our responsibility, not for us, but for our future generations, the ones we will not see. That's how I, I view these declarations as, as being instrumental to be heard and to be recognized and acknowledged, adopted. So um, it's taken a long time to get to even this, this time, this uh, coming week of um, the water, water week, the water conference, the United Nations water conference. Thank you, Mona. And finally, I want to bring us back to the Colorado River. And we've heard this mentioned a lot in, in the news about uh, the drought in the Colorado River Basin. And um, you are an internationally known voice for Indigenous wisdom, and you speak from uh, the place of growing up so close to that river. And I wonder if you could leave us with um, some thoughts about the way that you understand and experience the situation with the Colorado River Basin now and what you would like people to do to help support the people there. When I first, when I saw, the, you know, some parts of the river, um, you know, the levels going so far, to, you know, down and, and being concerned about it, I, I cried. I cried. I cried and uh, I cried because I think, as I said, you know, the, the, rip, the rivers, they're a system. They're part of a system. They're not just the river. There's a whole system that goes with it. Some of the springs, sacred springs, um, you know, that um, the tribes uh, have in their knowledge systems um, are, um, are part of that river. So the impact isn't just on the river but it's also on the tributaries. Um, you know, the tributaries are the ones that feed the river. Uh, it, it, was, it, was, it was painful for me to see. Um, and I, I felt like I needed to, um, to um, facilitate um, a process with tribes, river tribes. And so I, um, so I, I facilitated a conversation among some of the tribes, and part of that conversation was I asked them to bring forward and present their resolutions about the river. And in those resolutions are statements about how the how sacred the river is to them. Mm historical things about the river in their relationship. And I did that on purpose because I wanted to remind the leadership that this is your foundation mm. and your relationship with the river. This is what you're making a decision about in response to this, they called it a mega drought yeah. So um, it's still it's still in the process of uh, you know people uh, cutting back on their water usage. Um, tribes in Arizona, anyway, uh, we have water rights. Not all tribes have water rights, but um, but the way that uh, the law was set up for our water water rights is that. Um, 
it's based on what they call first in time, first in line. So, um, so according to that, that would mean that um, all the other Water River users um, um, would be the first ones to reduce reduce their water allocations. But of course, you know, tribes are being looked at to. Uh, to eventually uh, reduce their water allocations to share water with these um, urban um, areas mm -hmm. that are in urban settings that are um, really don't have water. Mm. Their groundwater is depleted. They really uh, they rely on the Colorado River through um, through a canal system where water is uh, pumped from the Colorado River in near where I live, Parker, and um, it's pumped across the state to central Arizona and then south to Tucson, Arizona. And there's a little tribe down here. Uh, there's a, It's not really a little tribe, actually. They're the second largest tribe in the country. Uh, but a little village south of here called the San Javier uh, District, the Walk community, mm. they are the last on the line. Hmm. of this water delivery system and so um so in looking at who who you know we as indigenous people are out where as i said you know we don't look at water as being a um owned but it belongs to all hmm. so when it comes to making sure that this little tiny village at the end of the line, gets water. We have that sacred responsibility to assure them that they're going to have water. So, those that's that's all I have to say right now. Thank you. Thank you, Mona. I it's powerful to hear that uh, value system that no one owns the water that it's to be shared by all that it is sacred. And we're very grateful to you for taking the time to share with us. Thank you so much. Thank you.